This is a story about a dude named Lane. He moved to the mainland and bought one place to stay. And then one day he went and tried to rent them out. And then he became one real investor man. This is Lane with the Simple Passive Cashflow Podcast. If you guys haven't already, please share the podcast with your friends. Because if you don't, soon you won't have any other friends to hang out with at lunch. When you're not doing anything at home with all that cash flow. And second, if you guys have any emails, questions, send it over to me. I'd like to figure out what you guys are wondering out there because, you know, sometimes I just kind of think that everybody knows some of this stuff and I just kind of glaze over it. I can get some questions going. I can answer it. Maybe we can have an Ask Lane show. Also, I wanted to introduce the Huey Mastermind Group, which is a mastermind that I'm taking small donations to charity to be a part of. It's, you know, it's only going to be probably under $100 a year. But if someone is interested in that, there's about a few more spots available for that. So please reach out to me. Want to introduce Kent Lamp today? How are you doing, Kent? Good. How are you, Lane? I'm doing awesome. So Kent's another in- investor, and I wanted to bring him on the line because he is very on his way. But he's he's not one of those guys that has a thousand units. So I thought there'd be a lot of good insights that Kent has, and he's also working the job on the side. Kent, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, my name is uh, Kent Lapp, and I live in Nashville, Tennessee. We moved here about three years ago from upstate New York. Upstate New York is uh, where I was born and raised. Now am running the family business, I guess, and have a couple other businesses as well, and have real estate on the side, which I'm super excited to talk about. It's Real estate has been an area of interest for me for quite some time. Married, four little kids, and so life is busy. I'm, I'm excited to dig into whatever you want to dig into today on this podcast. And I appreciate you having me on. It's an honor. Yeah. So how do we start off? How much simple passive cash flow are you making today and how are you doing it? For me, it's all, let's see here. It's, it's all multifamily. I do just have one single family home, but it's mostly multifamily. Uh, my, my goal was early on was to make a hundred thousand a year just from, you know, you know, passive income from real estate. And, you know, if you work at it for a time, which I have been investing in real estate now for 12, 13 years, uh, it, it does, you can get there and it does compound over time. And so I think there's, there's value in getting started early or whenever you're ready, certainly. But really my strategy is buy and hold, uh, cash flow, multifamily, and that's about it. I, I don't manage any of them directly myself. We do have good property managers that take care of that. And I'm a big fan of a great property management company. Uh, matter of fact, the first year that in upstate New York, there just wasn't that many property managers that we could find. We weren't happy with, with our options. So we started our own little property management company. And the fellow running it, you know, of course, I was paying that property management company just like I would pay any other property management company. And uh, we were charging 8% of the time. And the first year that they took over my properties, I made more money as the owner even after paying them 8% to manage everything. So I, that was a great lesson for me as in if you're going to do it yourself, you really need to know what you're doing and stay on top of things. And I think a lot of times, you know, it's just better to have someone that's in the business that's what they do. They can stay on top of things. And even after, you know, even after paying them that property management fee, I was able to make more net income that year, even after the fee, which was, which was exciting. So it's, it's nothing fancy for me. It's uh, pretty much buy and hold multifamily is, is what, you know, it's really what my strategy is right now. So what does that put your simple passive cash flow number today? Are you making a hundred percent of your expenses or where, where are you at with that? Yeah, yeah, we can live on our on our real estate now. So I like to work, and I don't plan to go into real estate full time. I I enjoy what I get to do, and so that's going to continue to be my job, if you will. And uh, and real estate is going to stay on the side. But it's nice to know that if a business doesn't work out, or there's challenges, or you know, I want to I want to change something or I stop enjoying what I'm doing, then it's great to have the the real estate income to fall back on. 
All right, the reason I ask this question is because a lot of people, they listen to the show and they just kind of, they, they take this advice as one dimensional and it's really not, you know, they hear what all these other people are doing, like Book Joffrey's doing this. And I'm like, well, you're not Uncle Buck, you know, yeah. you're not up to that yeah. level. Yes. Get, get a couple single families right. first and then let's talk about that. Or everybody hears that, hey, Kent's doing multifamily. This guy's doing multifamily. Lane brings a lot of multifamily people on board. But maybe we should do multifamily. I'm like, no, no, do single family home first. But then they said, yeah. then they say, well, Lane, you said single family homes was a mistake. I'm like, well, <laughs> no. <laughs> let's have a conversation about this, and that's the reason why there's that button on my website. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a great point, Lane. Uh, you know, my first buy was a ten unit apartment building, but. That's only because my mom owned it. I bought it from her. Unfortunately, she didn't give me much of a discount, so I paid market rate. But she owned it, and I was managing it for her. And if that, what if I didn't know about the property and have been managing it myself for a couple of years, there's no way I would have started with a 10 unit. And I completely agree with the premise start with a single family. It's it's simple, it's easier, and there's a lot of principles and learnings that you can take from a single family to a three unit to a 10 unit and so on. And I think that's a great premise. Just learning things like how, how bank financing can work and how depreciation works and how tenant relations should work and how to work with your property management company. Those are all things that that once you learn it on a single family, yeah, there's there's some differences when you get into some of the other stuff, but a lot of it is a lot of it is exactly the same. All right, single family is definitely not as scalable as multifamily, but it's a start, and you learn about the stuff. And a lot of people say that you can get started multifamily just off the bat, like how you did. I I personally don't believe that. Mm-hmm. I think you can get blown out doing something like that. But um, I mean, you you took over this ten unit. What were you kind of thinking at that time? I mean, it, it was, I guess it was stabilized, right? Yeah, it, well, it was stabilized, but the the net income was very low. Um, I remember just thinking, well, well, when I started managing it for my mother who owned it at the time, I would have been probably uh, about in my late teens. And man, when I took it over just as managing it uh, for her, it, it really just wasn't being managed properly at all. I mean, it would have been... It, it would not have been anywhere close to like an eight or a ten percent cap rate. I mean, it was, it was making you know co- you know several grand a year, but nothing close to what it, what it uh, is now. So I think coming in there and realizing that that guy was just not managing anywhere close to as good as he could, I tried to do a a much better job, and I think it worked. But as I was also managing it, there was just some things that that I could see that maybe we could do if I owned it, that could make it better. So, um, that really was, that really was, I think what propelled me to, to try even then with, with having seen all the numbers and having experience, it was scary for me to start. Uh, I remember thinking even, even then that maybe I should get a partner in on this deal. And, uh, and, and I struck a deal where we could do owner financing. So I didn't need a partner. I had in just enough of cash to do the owner financing thing. Uh, but just by nature of it being new and scary, uh, you know, I thought about bringing a partner in and then didn't. And now I'm certainly glad that I did, did not. But uh, I think we, we came in, it was relatively full, but then just tried to raise rents where we could, get better tenants where we could, do a little fixing up here and there when someone moved out so we could get a little bit more rent. Uh, we charged, started charging rents for, for pets and Early on, we just, just we said no pets, but then we had trouble filling the apartments. So then we just charged a little extra, and and um, last year we actually made a couple grand just off of our pet rent at that location. I mean, we, there there really wasn't any one thing that we did. It was just a lot of little things to kind of make the cash flow better on that on that property. I like to think of it like a checklist. You got all these things that on this checklist, like barbecue pits, dog parks, or different amenities and. Right. So what is your Han Solo moment? And if you don't know what that is, it's Han Solo and his buddy Chewbacca from Star Wars were cruising the galaxy as little life smugglers, but then crossed paths with Luke and Leia and took a pivot point. Describe a time where you felt the resistance and the catalyst to change and what happened. 
Yeah, I, I, I think it was just realizing that if we can, if these numbers work, if the if the the numbers that we're looking at here on some of these real estate deals work close to as good as we think they will, then if you look years down the road, because planning for the future is important and it's easy to ca- get caught up in the here and now, but when you look down the road into the future and you think about what you want, what kind of wind you might want at your back financially or just for time constraints, say 10 years from now, that does require a little bit of a different type of thinking as opposed to just you know working, making money and spending it kind of and living in the moment, living for the day or the week or the month or whatever. So I think when I, th- when I looked at the numbers and some of the projections on some of these and even just the initial deal, just getting started, you know, right out of the gate, it's like, well, okay, you get you get this much income, um, and that's nice. But man, when you start looking down the road, ten or fifteen years, and if the plan actually works, you know, what kind of what kind of results might you have ten or fifteen years down the road, even if the numbers are not quite as good, but you know, close to as good as you're projecting? I think when I realized that, I think that was kind of the moment where it's like, all right. It's a little scary. We're going to do this owner financing deal. That means I owe quite a bit of money here, but it looks like the cash flow can cover it. And plus, if everything works out in 10 or 15 years, I'm going to be really glad that I did it. And I think that that was the moment where it's like, man, if these numbers are are close to accurate, let's think about how this thing will be 10 or 15 years from now. And and um, I, I think that was kind of the the moment where, and, and also just realizing, you know, why that is. And that would be because, well, when I'm 10 years older than I was at the time, I would want, what would I want? I would want more stable income. I would want more passive income. I'd want to offset some, offset some income through depreciation and have tax savings and those things. So I, I think it really would, for me, was just kind of being able to kind of break away from the here and now, look into the future, and then maybe make some decisions accordingly based on what I wanted, you know, even 10 years down the road, which is not always easy. Uh, and I'm certainly not the best at it, but yeah, we're kind of getting through the beginning of the year. So a lot of people are calling me lately and I'm taking them to the same thought process of, hey, if you keep doing what you're doing with that 401k and the stocks, you're going to have to keep working at your job for another 30, 40 years and hope that you have enough. Yes. Whereas you do this kind of stuff. I mean, you could be retired in five years and certainly your spouse can quit in a few years. And if, if you like your job, you can go to 75%. But then, yes. I mean, that, that's that's how I lay out the options. I mean, you got this one or that one. What do you want? And then ultimately, most people will say, well, I don't have any money to get started. I'll do it when I get started. And I, then I'll say, well, you got 401k money. We can play with that. You got some Roth money. You can play with that. Yep. And at that point, it's all excuses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, and since you brought up the stock market, I mean, I think another marker in history for me, just with this whole real estate thing, was there was a time where I was interested in learning a lot more about stocks and mutual funds and had some mutual funds and uh, even was interested in day trading and, you know, the kind of just playing that whole game and was playing around on E-Trade and learning everything I could on it and reading some books and even had a guy come over to the house that we paid $500. I remember that. And I think there was about four or five other guys that I was able to get together, I think it wound up costing us about $100 a person. And this guy was like supposed to be like, you know, know this stuff really well. And and we had him over to the house and he taught us, you know, for several hours, you know, all about this stuff. And I just remember just not, honestly, not completely getting it even then and then trying it and it really not working that well. And, And finally, I was just like, all right, you know, maybe this works great for other people, but I don't think it's the game I want to play. There's too much going for real estate, I can actually understand it, and that's just going to be my focus. All right, that other stuff is quite stressful, and I mean, you can't leverage it. I mean, you can, but <laughs> that's how you get killed. You can't yes. leverage it like real estate. Yeah, it's exactly that's exactly right. Yeah, I don't invest in things that aren't a hard asset, don't produce income, and something I don't understand. Yeah, and I think, just one more note on that real quick, I think, you know, you you, you just saying that and abiding by that. I think it's that's so key. I know it gets it gets talked about a fair bit and people might have heard about it, but just the fact of having kind of your own way, your own niche, your own strategy, that's so important because if you're just like, well, I'm an investor and whatever comes along, 
uh, whether it's you know whatever uh, s stocks or or uh, real estate or or the next thing or or whatever, the ability to sit down and think about what you're after and why and kind of what your lane will be, what your strategy will be, and then sticking to it largely. I think there's tons of value in that. Right. So, so Ken, you had, you bring an interesting viewpoint on this. You know, as you got started, you had that side business going, and you know, for me, I mean, I'm just a W two employee. It's pretty straightforward. You know, the W two income for me is not going to take me anywhere near. But you had this kind of other avenue that you could potentially blow up and you know be a lot bigger than even real estate. What was your kind of thoughts there, and how to you know walk both those paths? Yeah, well, the issue with just making a bunch of money because you own a business is that you're going to wind up paying a bunch of taxes. And, you know, it's it's kind of obvious, but it's true. It's not about what you make. It's about what you keep. And so the depreciation benefits of having real estate while making, you know, good or great or exceptional money on the business side as a business owner, I think they complement each other really well. So I wasn't after like an either or, and I'm still not after an either or now. Like I don't, you know, this plan could change, but I don't plan to get into real estate full time. But I love real estate. I'm passionate about it. I love hearing other people's stories. I love the benefits, the passive income, offsetting taxes, just all of it. Uh, it I really do enjoy it. Now, I'm not planning to do that full time, but I'm also, you also can see pretty easily enough of the benefits of having that going alongside um, a business to offset taxes. And, and look, it's, it's also not a secret that, um, you know, sometimes businesses that are in business for long periods of time and own some of their own real estate, their own stores or whatever. I mean, when you look up, you realize that the real estate within the business was some of the, you know, was some of the key value there. And, um, so I, I think just looking, you know, using them to complement each other, not so much in either or is how I was looking at that earlier on. I'd say it's probably still how I look at it today. Have you ever thought about being a passive in syndications? I mean, I guess I just notes wouldn't work because they don't give you the depreciation. Yeah, I've, I've not, honestly, I've not thought that much about it or looked into it in depth. I'm not opposed to it. It's just, you know, not right now. It's I have enough going on the business side, with, and that's kind of like my full time job, and I enjoy it. So I'm not I'm not really looking to take more and more and more of my time until it's full time on real estate. I just like having that, you know, your terms that simple passive income on the side uh, that kicks off, you know, tax advantages and all that as well. Well, as recent as you know, the last couple of years, you know, when this whole, whole thing came out with. I mean, there's just, there's always something coming out, right? I mean, it was healthcare and then taxes are going up and all these other things where as a business owner, it's like, man, that's uh they don't seem to be making it easier on you as time goes along. And the real estate helps complement all those things. And plus, if the business environment gets really poor for a period of time, then you would have this real estate income that's going to be steady. So I, I like the way they complement each other. I'm not necessarily looking to, to get into real estate full time, actually. Right. Imagine it, uh, it gives you that peace of mind so you're not making hasty decisions. And even in negotiations, you uh, you have a solid spot to negotiate from because you know we got that real estate in the back pocket. That's right. And, and it also allows you to not take an income from a, from a business if you wanted to for a period of time because you wanted to reinvest more and then you could you know, rely on your real estate income. So it really does give you a lot of options. Kent, what's your uh, worst life and bit or business in the moment? What did you do after it? What was the lesson learned? In business, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of things. Um, in real estate, I'm thinking a time in particular where I was at, uh, I was at a, a social function and I got a call because there was a fire in one of my buildings and there was drugs involved and it just wasn't a very good situation at all. Unfortunately, no one was hurt, um, but I had to leave the function and drive there. It was, it was only 10 or 15 minutes from where I was at, thankfully, but this was when I was managing them myself. And I just thought, you know what, that was not... This is really not what I'm after. I'm not after managing these things myself. It's supposed to be on the side. It's supposed to be passive income. And yet here I am having to leave this function. 
drive over because someone had a little fire going and I'm dealing with the fire department and the tenant and all this stuff. And I think that, you know, realizing, hey, this is really not what I'm after. And if I would get a good property management company involved, then they would be handling all this. And I think that was that was a key moment for me as well. And just learning, hey, let's be honest with with myself. What is it that I want here? Uh, because it's not this. And so let's work towards let's work towards a little bit more what I want, which is having someone else to be able to kind of handle the, the drama. That kind of reminds me of another story where uh, another investor was putting on this mass local mastermind and, you know, a lot of other investors were coming to it. And this one guy said, no, he had to do something with the tenant or, and I was like, well, that's what for property management's for. And yes. you get other ideas that are going to, you know, potentially make you thousands of more dollars down the line. And yeah, but you know, whatever. You know, it was a, yeah. it was an older gentleman, and you know, nobody listens to me. Yeah, what do I know, right? <laughs> right, right. Well, well, I think it's a good example because sometimes, sometimes it is easy to uh, step over dollars to pick up quarters, and I think you know, it it really is too easy a lot of times, and and I think that that could be a good example. I mean, I don't know the the exact circumstances, but. But yeah, I think that's a great point. Yeah, you know, I, I tell people, be careful where you take your information from. Because if someone's been doing this for like 30, 40 years, you know, are, really, are they really that good at it? I mean, shouldn't it be like done in five to 10 if they're really that effective or have the best sure. strategies? Yep. Yeah, exactly. Not being one of the big boys in investing quite yet, aka the accredited investor in the eyes of the SEC, it's tough to find good options for investing. But then I started investing in the American Homeowner Preservation Fund, or AHP Fund, which is crowdfunding the mortgage crisis in America. The fund collaborates with existing homeowners to keep them in their homes. It's a way to make great returns while feeling good about making a social impact. After investing myself in the fund, it was awesome when they approached me to become an advertiser of the company. You can start investing with as little as 100 bucks, and if you want the free Burn Zone book, please send me an email to lane at simplepassivecashflow.com. So what is your uh, current two-week experiment and or six-month project? What are you uh, kind of working on these days so people can kind of see that you're constantly improving and constantly working on new things? The two-week thing is probably centered mostly around diet and maybe even fasting. And I'm reading you know, Tim Ferriss's Tools of Titans. Right now, I'm a huge Tim Ferriss fan. And he's got the ketogenic diet in there and some of the, the fasting tips and so I actually haven't been to the doctor in a couple of years. You know, fortunately, I don't have to go to the to the doctor or the hospital all that often and seem to be relatively healthy. But I have a schedule, just a general wellness checkup. And uh, I want to talk to them about some of this stuff and then just try it. I got some of the some of the testing, the uh, where you can test your blood and, and see how your different levels are if you go through like a three day fast. So I'm actually pretty excited about it. Uh, I'm not excited about not not going largely without food for three days, but I'm excited about starting to experiment a little bit more with my personal health and just the science behind some of it. So that's kind of what I'm. I would say is kind of my 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 two week experiment. As far as a six month project, yeah, I um I actually fast every single day. I eat dinner at eight, and then I won't eat till like one p.m. the next day. I have the simple pass really? of coffee. I mean, that's what all my friends are doing. Wow. So, so you're eating dinner at eight and uh, then you won't eat again until one the next day? Yeah. And that three day fast, I don't know. I don't really, I like to eat. So I don't. Okay. But I know a lot of people throw that in every few weeks. But yeah. I mean, it works. I mean, I, I started doing that like probably five years ago. And then, I mean, why do, why do we follow this dogma of all these snacks that, you know, supposedly yeah. is put up by all these snack companies that wants us to eat this stuff? Right. I don't know. I mean, think for yourself, whatever works for you. I mean, I don't think your doctor's going to yeah. tell you this, but I know some yep. doctors that do this too. That's that's interesting. So does that get you – well, why do you do that? Because I read a little PDF book and I tried it out and it worked. Okay. Okay. <laughs> interesting. And does that, get, does that get you in ketosis or are you burning different types of fats because you're doing that? or, or I, what don't, was I don't think I get into ketosis. Played around with those little sticks at one time. Okay. okay. But um, I don't know. I just run a little leaner. I have a lot of energy. And I I mean, I'm more performance-based. I used to do CrossFit and I like to do okay. sports. So, I mean, if I'm performing well, then 
that's the that's the indicator in my opinion. Yes. Oh, that's very interesting. I like I've got, I've got other friends that kind of do like all the DEXA scans. If you want their contact, you can um, we can okay. talk about that later. But I don't know. I mean, I, I think the whole point is find what works for you. I mean, I, yeah. I used to lug around all these Tupperwares to eat, you know, every two hours. But I think <laughs> the main thing is question things, figure things out for yourself. I agree completely. I can tell you for a fact, uh, only eating at eight and one every day would be tough for me because I do love to snack. <laughs> and so that's going to be tough whether it's a fast or switching to a, an eating habit that you have. But that's that's very interesting. I'll look it up and, and I may give that a try myself. But you're you're right. You you see what's right for you. Yeah. As far as a six month project, uh, something that I'm thinking a lot about lately is how I want to spend my time. And looking back over 2016. How have I spent my time? How do do I want to make some small changes or maybe even big changes going forward? I know for a fact that I'm not I'm not utilizing my time uh, really anywhere close to as good as I should be in the morning before work and in the evening after work. I think the middle part's okay, the work part, but the the uh, the morning and in the evening I I've got a lot of room for improvement there. And just thinking about you know if there is anything else schedule wise that I want to build in here and kind of incorporate into my life on a more consistent basis in 2017. So I don't think for me, it's going to drastically change everything, but I have been thinking a lot about it here in, in the last couple of months and uh, we'll probably be making some changes going forward. So I, I think that's probably my, my six month project. I think that's a good idea. Chunking and scheduling for tasks. That's right. Systems. What is your simple passive cash flow number? And imagine you had two times that amount. What what is that number first? And then what's your ideal day? And what would you be doing at that point? Yeah, I think well, my number would probably be, you know, I mean, the number that I've that I've stuck with was a hundred grand a year in real estate income. That has come and gone. I don't actually have another number beyond that, except to do more of what I'm currently doing. But if I were just to take that hundred grand number and you know times that times you know two or four or whatever, uh, I think it would be. And then and then as far as what the results of that would be or could be, I just get really excited about having an idea, and then kind of creating a strategy around that idea. And getting someone really capable to lead that and kind of helping them as they lead that. I just really, really enjoy that. So if I had uh, more money than I knew what to do with, I think it would be doing more of that and continuing to invest in real estate so that when those, when those occasional business ideas don't work out very good, that you have some options and some recurring income. So since you're a Tim Ferriss fan, some of the things that he's been saying lately is if you have money, you you should throw money at your problems. And in reality, you shouldn't have any problems because if you couldn't throw money at it, well, I'll say it's a concern, you know, or worry yes. that you couldn't have done anything about it. So what's something that you recently thought about burning your cash on for a time savings or improvement of quality of life? Maybe coaching. I've tried coaching in the past and had sometimes good and sometimes mediocre results. I uh, have not had a professional career or life coach here for a couple of years, but I've thought about it more, more recently, you know, what the benefits of that would be just from an accountability standpoint, a sounding board standpoint, and, and that would cost money. So that's one thing that I've, that I've thought about. I, I'm probably not serious about it right now. I don't have plans to do that, but what kind I of, thought about what, that one what recently. What does that kind of cost? Right now, I don't know. I mean, I've I, I've seen in the past, I've seen anywhere from 10, 12 grand a year to much more than that. So, and and to be fair, there's probably there's probably the limit more limited options that would cost even less than that. But um, somewhere in that 10 to 15 grand and up range per year seems to be relatively common. I'm a proponent of coaching too. I think if, if you're going to do it, make sure that they have that residual uh, network that you can kind of work off of in the future. That's a big part of it. It just doesn't stop I, with the training or the online webinar or whatever. Yeah, that's actually, that's a great point. Anything else that you would like to burn your cash on for time savings or just for the heck of it? 
Uh, well, I would like an airplane. I think that would be cool. So if we had some cash, I think that would save some time with travel. Uh, of course, then you have to have someone to fly it. So that would cost a little bit more cash. Um, but I've always loved aviation and have taken some lessons myself, but haven't flown here in, uh, since we moved to Nashville about three years ago. Uh, aside from that, which obviously is a big one, if I were thinking about cash burning for some tips and tricks in smaller ways. I don't think any one particular thing comes to mind, really. I think, well, well, what I will say is generally about the end of the year, I do kind of put some thought into this and kind of recap on the year and and um, have not done that this year yet because we just had a baby a couple of weeks ago. So that'll be that kind of stepping back and looking at how my life is going in the last year and some of the things that I would maybe change going forward. That'll be that time and kind of focus will be happening here in the next week or two. So if you ask me in two weeks from now, I'll probably have a better answer right now. Nothing really is coming to mind. And yeah, maybe you should uh, get in touch with Dave Zook, who's there in Tennessee. He's got that airplane. And then Dave, Dave Zook is my brother-in-law. I know him oh. very <laughs> <laughs> I will get in touch with him. <laughs> Last question here is Tony Robbins identifies two large concepts they were continually struggling to gain perfection at. First is the law of fulfillment and second is the science of achievement. So if you die tomorrow or first, what would your secret or hack to be to the scientific achievement? Any habits to share? On the scientific achievement side, I mean, I think any success that I've been able to have through the years has often centered around fleshing out an idea or a strategy and then finding the right people to help with it. And... You know, I guess by nature of my experience and, and you know, my role in my companies is largely uh, um, has probably contributed to that. But I think I think that would be it for for me. Um, the importance of having really great people helping or leading the efforts and the goal that you're trying to attain to. I think I think that would be it for me. How do you um, balance that with, you know, another thought is, you know, hey, look at McDonald's, right? They, they hire the worst talent, but they create the systems. Is it both yeah. or is it one more important than the other? Well, I think systems are absolutely important. But uh, the only thing I would say to that is like with McDonald's, they've had really smart people that help to create the systems and the processes. Now, I do love a business model like that where they have such – strong systems and processes that people at the local level or the, you know, in the trenches that they don't have to be apparently too super picky with their hiring and the, and the business model works. I actually love that as a business model, but there's a lot of time and effort and attention that went into creating that system and process. And they had smart people at the top that were creating that. So I do absolutely believe in process and when it when it at the end of the day we've had discussions around here before like at the end of the day what's more important people or process and everyone says people right but i mean that's kind of the answer but uh process is is so important so i would say i would stick to my original answer but not in any way to uh degrade the importance of process i think that's absolutely key Maybe high skilled work or you know mind work is people, but commodity work like flipping burgers is process. Maybe yeah, it's well, a two sided thing. Yeah, I, I think I think that's that's a great way to look at it. But if you were just to think about starting something, if I was to think about starting something uh, fresh or a new business, I would think about you know the goal and the strategy and everything, and then if there was a key person, you'd get that person on board. But you would always be thinking about what will be the process if this guy would leave or, you know, not just not show up at work one day or, or, and, and, and be developing that. So I think you need to start somewhere so you can really start with really good people, but yeah, you want to be developing the process on an ongoing basis. So what is your slash secret hack for the art of fulfillment? How do you contribute back? Well, that's a difficult question. I'm not sure if I have a very good answer on the art of fulfillment. If there was one thing that I can think about for me that's maybe been helpful is, and it sounds terrible because everyone says it, but is to try to 
occasionally slow down and really enjoy a very small and simple thing. And so when you're driving to work and the sun comes up in your rearview mirror and it's just absolutely beautiful, uh, exceptionally, it's easy to kind of look past that and just be thinking about everything else you can be thinking about. Or for me, you know, on that Saturday night in the summer when the kids are actually sleeping and the sun's going down and my wife and I are sitting on the back porch, you know, having a drink or something, it's easy to think about next week and the next day and the next schedule and the next challenge. But look, it's summer. It's a summer night. You're on your back porch. The kids are sleeping. Let's just enjoy this a little bit. So for me, it's, it was difficult to enjoy the moment and to enjoy the small things earlier in life. And I'm, I'm not good at it right now, but I'm starting to see the value. And so that would be my answer, just being able to occasionally slow down and really enjoy something very simple. And I think there's a lot of fulfillment in that. And how old are you now? Uh, 32. So I think I think we're about the same age. So I feel like the 20s are the age where you really should be hustling. But yes, at some point, you got to put it in neutral, I guess. I, I agree. I mean, my theory, my goal, I should say, coming into my 20s was the 20s would be the time where I would really focus on work and creating income and some of those things. And, you know, I got married young, so I was married early on in my 20s. And my wife, you know, wasn't sure about that. Now, we tried to not, you know, push off all of life, but I was pretty, pretty clear on the plan. And there was times where she would rather I'd, I'd been at home as opposed to working. But the goal was to work really hard in my 20s so that we could get some momentum coming into our 30s and maybe slow down a little bit. And I'll, I'll say, you know, just for the benefit of those out there that are thinking about getting into a little bit more real estate or beginning and those types of things I I do want to say like the plan, the plan is working. So just to encourage those people that are thinking about getting started, but not really sure. Uh, it's, it's just, I would encourage them to be smart about it and run the numbers, but to start somewhere because you can build momentum over time. Yeah, I personally don't have kids, but I think when I do, I'll probably just hopefully have the business passive enough where I don't really have to do anything. Sure. But maybe I'm just going to take a Michael Jordan hiatus. There you go. Retire. Absolutely. I, I, a lot of people tell me, well, well, that's great, Lane, that you're, what you're doing, but I have like a one-year-old, and I'm like, yep. well, perfect. That little guy's not going to remember anything till he's like four. Yeah. <laughs> Bust your butt. <laughs> Get a yeah. couple rentals, get proof of concept, and then when he is three or four, when he starts remembering, that's when you quit your job or go half time, and yeah. you, then you can go on the same Michael Jordan hiatus too. Yeah, that's right. Well, I think it's in our culture today, it's awful hard to the concept of sacrificing a little bit on the front end so you can gain more over time is is sometimes difficult, but. I think it's an important concept, and I think there's a lot of value in being able to, not that you defer life, but being able to start, and there might be a season of time where you're working a little extra, but if you can create a plan and work it over time, you can have some results that, you know, you can you can get to be more flexible with schedule or do some things that, you know, you might not otherwise be able to do. Different paths for everyone. I mean, I'm personally, let's busted for like a few years so you can live the other few decades like no one else can right but some people like to spread it out and you know have an enjoyable life i'm i'm like no take that terrible job so you can get that high income so you can put into real estate is my attitude yes that was my attitude early on and um you know i i that was kind of the goal like i said kind of for my for my 20s so Look, I understand there's different people in different seasons of life. Uh, you know, I'm sure you, there's there's not a, you know, just one formula for everybody, but the principle, I think. So it might look different in practice for different people, but I think the principle is absolutely the same. All right, great. Great chatting with you, Ken. Uh, anything we missed or any contact information you'd like to get out, people get a hold of you? Yeah, man. I mean, the only thing I would add is I was just thinking there was a guy a couple years ago that I that I was talking to. Um, at a gathering and he was asking about some of the real estate and he was super interested and he was thinking about getting into it and uh, so we had a good talk and we, were, we talked for a little while about it and um, I could just it, I had a sense when I left that conversation that he wanted to talk about it he wanted to learn but he just wasn't going to do anything with it 
and and this was a this was a a um, a fellow that was I think primed to do something. He had the income, you know, he had a job, he had a little family. I mean, I think he was primed to do something with it, and I just had the sense that that maybe nothing was going to happen. And a couple years later, I saw him again, and sure enough, he hasn't started yet. So. And I would just, people that are interested in, in this, you need to be smart. You need to run out the numbers. You, you need to, you know, you, you do need to do your due diligence, but you also just need to start sometime. And so I would just encourage people to, to take that start if they're, you know, if they're, if this is what they want to do. And, um, I love the idea of starting with single family and getting some experience and growing it from there. So, I mean, that, I think that's my final thought. Um, as far as contact, probably Twitter. At Kent Lap is the um, the best way to get in touch with me. I also have a bit of a blog at kentlap.com. So those are two great ways that people can say hi or, or get in touch. All right, Kent. Great conversations here. Appreciate it. We'll get you on the next time and see what you're up to. So, sounds great, Lane. Thanks for having me on. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.